Good morning, and welcome to the 23rd annual exhibit of hydrogen fuel cells and technology, including batteries. We've been here for 23 years discussing the innovations and the way to integrate this technology in the expanding renewable energy market. This is an issue, it's always been a problem, and I'm thrilled to have Jochen Linsen from the Forschungszentrum Mulich up on the stage. We'll be talking about comparing fueling infrastructures for zero emission transportation. Please welcome with me, Jochen Linsen. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, uh, curiosity, I suppose, first, uh, the uh, Julich booth is right over there, but uh, for those who don't know, uh, what do you people do at Julich? It's a large organization, <laughs> isn't it? Okay, thank you. So, thank you for uh, being the first speaker for today. And uh, I would like to say something to our research center. So in our research center, we are looking at different technologies. One of the core is really energy technologies. And we are developing energy technologies for, in Germany, we call it Energiewende, that has a, this transition towards renewable and low emission uh, um, energy carriers. So. In my case, we are, let's say, also at the systems analysis perspective. So that means we have our technologies developed, and then we have a special, we have a special look to the energy systems and see where these technologies could be the most beneficial uh, technologies or the most beneficial opportunity. And therefore, I think it's a really good combination of technology level and also systems uh, uh, level. And therefore, I think it's a good combination to have both in this research center. If you would like to know more about technologies, please go to uh, our exhibition. You learn more about that, and you see also some interesting uh, labs and uh, technology. We can think about uh, the electrical grid, uh, that historical product of um, um, the way we use energy as a technology, and some people consider renewable energy a disruptive technology. Uh, we had a perfectly functioning uh, grid, and along comes these renewables. They're all great ideas, but the problem is uh, uh, you never know when the sun's shining, particularly you never know when the wind is blowing uh, the hardest, and we do not know what to do with this increasing quantity of renewable energies. Now, you've studied this. Um, and this is a question about the existing electrical grid, but it's also not simply um, electricity we're talking about. When we go to transportation, there's that huge energy budget. So um, in terms of the overall system, where are we now? Uh, what effect is the renewable energy having? And what are we going to do with it? Yeah, that's a good question. And this is the question we are mainly dealing with, all, let's say, nearly all of the time. So. What we have now in Germany and also in Europe is a grid that has developed over 100 years and more. So, and now we have a rapid change of renewable energy, let's say, coming into the market in the last 10 years. So, and now the question is how we can develop the infrastructure, the grid, making it that it is uh, able to take all the renewable energy and so on and make something really good out of that. So, and to be a little bit more larger, that's not only uh, electricity grid, that's the whole energy system. So the question is also how we can take advantage of the uh, renewable energy that we have in the electricity system, also in other sectors. That means where, that means location and also application, that means also transportation and public uh, transport, for example, and when because you always have to have the energy, you have to supply the demand, so therefore if you have a fluctuating renewable, and then you have to take care that the demand is always supplied. So you have to do something like flexible demand, like storage, or new consumers like transportation. And hydrogen, let's say, could be one of these uh, opportunities. So therefore, what we do is taking the energy system as a whole, also modeling something, and see what are additional benefits for this renewable energy. And we do it not only for today, we do it also in scenario studies for 2050 or beyond. And then the question is, when you go for 80%, 95% renewable electricity, then the question becomes, what do you do with 
fluctuating energy and in sometimes we have more energy than we need and you have to take care about that. What you do with this, we call it surplus, but surplus is not energy for free. You have to do something what is really important with that and we did a study uh, for transportation where we can use some of this surplus electricity for transportation. When we um, think about the grid, the best thing about the grid is already paid for, the electrical energy grid. Um, and as soon as we add renewables, um, uh, a lot of people have their hair on fire because what they think is, okay, we've got extra energy here. Uh, we are not sure how to store it. Uh, we're not sure how to transport it in what form. Uh, I think most people understand that renewable energy, um, largely it's electricity. Uh, as it's generated the wind turbines um, and uh, converting it to hydrogen is an ancient technology that has become very effective. Uh, but the question is, uh, the electrical energy grid, it's already paid for and here are you know, people with their hair on fire saying, how are we going to transport this? How expensive is this going to be? It's a cost question, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, it's a cost issue and therefore we did one of these studies that is called the infrastructure study. That the name was uh, like comparative analysis of infrastructure. And the starting point of this study was really to look into detail what would be the cost of such an infrastructure? What would be the investment that is needed for installing hydrogen infrastructure? And this was really because it was comparative. Also to have a look in battery electric vehicle and also have a look on fuel cell electric vehicle, taking part of energy systems and uh, hydrogen production and to make this comparison, what will be the cost of this infrastructure hydrogen? What will be the cost of the charging infrastructure? Because charging infrastructure is not included currently in the grid. You have to install uh, charging stations. You have to install grid enforcement, for example, at some places. And therefore, you have to take care, let's say, what are the additional investments that you have to do for that? But I would like to, to supply, or let's say, to answer one of the questions. So, when you have renewables in the system, and you have a lot of them, then it is, there is an easy rule. So the first, you should use electricity that is produced from renewables, if you can. So flexible demand is, is quite important. So the second one is, if you uh, cannot produce or you cannot use it, then you have to produce it from somewhere else, let's say from uh, natural gas power plants with uh, some low gas, uh, low, low carbon gas and so on. And if option one and two do not work, then go to storage. So therefore, I think it's there you have three opportunities that is flexible demand, flexible generation, and storage. And hydrogen is flexible demand and storage together. So therefore, it was quite interesting to take this infrastructure analysis. And uh, I think the outcome of that infrastructure analysis was, yes, it is expensive, and we are talking about 40 billion euros for the infrastructure hydrogen and we're talking about around 50 billion euros for the charging infrastructure. And this was really something interesting in this study because you see these numbers, so the hydrogen infrastructure turns out to be cheaper than the charging infrastructure and this depends strongly on fast charging and the high, let's say, cost of these uh, opportunities. But the interesting point too was this 40 or 50 billion euros, it sounds quite a lot for the investment. But if you take other infrastructures like the electricity grid we have today or like road infrastructures, it's quite low. So if you compare that, let's say we have a road transportation plan in Germany and then we are talking about 280 billion euros, let's say, for the investment in the next 10 years that we have to invest in roads. And this infrastructure, hydrogen and also charging would cost around 90 billion, let's say, both together. Then you have a fully developed infrastructure for, let's say, charging and refueling hydrogen. Charging battery electrics and refueling hydrogen vehicles. So, to rob us of our easy solutions and the illusions that some people have here, um, uh, already uh, people are pushing electric vehicles here. Um, if 40% of the population were driving electrical vehicles, could the grid as it exists today absorb that demand? Yeah, that's a good question. And in this study, we also calculated that. So this charging infrastructure is not a topic to the transmission grid. 
So the transmission grid is not the thing that is affected by battery electric vehicles, but the distribution grid, that is the biggest topic of all. So, and the distribution grid is by, let's say, a factor of 10 more expensive than the transmission grid. So if you have to do something with charging and you have to improve your, let's say, your distribution grid, so it costs you some money. So therefore, it, I think it is possible to do that, yes, definitely, but you have to invest in distribution grid, you have to invest in charging station. And then the second thing is, you also definitely should think about controlled charging. That is the most important thing. Let's say that you have at some times the opportunity to shift demand, let's say a low demand, a charging demand from one hour to the other, and then a little bit relieve the grids and uh, then it's okay. So therefore you see there is no silver bullet and that was also the outcome of this study. There is no silver bullet. So the, the battery electric vehicles and the infrastructure has a clear advantage at efficiency. Yes, definitely. But the hydrogen infrastructure itself also has a big benefit because you can use surplus electricity and you have a storage that is really inherent in the system. And this is, I think, that was really, when you have an energy systems view on this problem, I think this is really the biggest advantage. You have to take really this advantage, taking it as a system solution. When you mention the system, there's another um, wrench in the works, as we say. Uh, a lot of renewable energy uh, is uh, based on one large resource in the, in the north of Germany. It's wind turbines. Um, and of course, energy demand could be in several areas in Europe. We all know that people are talking about uh, getting cables running from the north down to Bavaria where they need the energy. Um, uh, that is, uh, even locally, there could be a long distance between uh, where the energy is produced um, and where it's sent to, and then you have the issue of how it's going to be consumed. Um, if you look at this large resource in the north, is it more effective to convert it to hydrogen on site? Uh, do you do that in scale, depending on how many people locally can absorb that? Yeah. Um, how much energy do you lose when you send gigawatts of power from one end of the country to the other? So that is really a, a big question. So the, the question is, let's say, in Germany we have the problem, let's say, well, if, if you can call it a problem, but we have this high renewable energy in the north of Germany, like offshore, like onshore wind capacities, these are the big capacities. And to be honest, most of the people live in the, in the west, in the, in the middle of Germany and in the south. So you always have to transport electricity renewable from the north to the middle to the south. And therefore, you have definitely have a problem with transmission of that. So electricity, there is already this grid development plan on the way, let's say for Germany, to do that. Let's say you can transport that from the north to the south. But even that is, causes some problems with surplus electricity. And therefore, if you install hydrogen generation in the north and transport it all over Germany, and we did that in the study, let's say, to show that it is possible with a hydrogen infrastructure, with pipelines, and also with uh, uh, gaseous truck transportation, and then you can distribute it over Germany. And we, uh, these numbers that I told before, this 40 billion and this 51 billion, for, this is include everything, like the transportation from the, uh, from the generation point to the usage of the vehicle. And therefore, I think you can do something special in when you put a hydrogen pipeline system to the existing one, and then you also have additional benefit to the transmission grid, because then it is relieved in some times of the uh, of the uh, of the year, let's say, from uh, uh, transporting big amounts of energy from the north to the south, and then you have a, an additional transport infrastructure that helps you in this situation, and this uh, infrastructure also have a storage included. And therefore, I think this is a good opportunity really to have both. So our uh, outcome of the study is really, it is a good opportunity to make the best of both. Let's say not excluding something. It's really like develop a hydrogen infrastructure and uh, do the best out of it. And also for the battery electric fix and charging, also combine it to one solution and get the best of both. That is our message. And of course, the elegance that you uh, have an energy form you can store 
um, instantaneously after conversion to hydrogen is wonderful. Um, I don't want to forget the most important issue here. Um, about five or six years ago, the moderators here were often criticized because we were always the tree huggers, we loved the clean stuff, and we weren't talking about business models. And uh, I think about three or four years ago, we got the message from the manufacturers of electrolysis, uh, why don't you talk about our business model, please? You know, it's, it, this is not nonprofit, R&D driven, give us a grant. <laughs> Um, things have changed, but we're still trying to achieve something. That is, um, and this is part of your zero emission policy here, uh, we're under European uh, pressure within Germany. Several cities have ozone alarms, they have the fine particle dust, they have the nitrous, what is the, 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 um, um, the noxious gas that um, affects the lungs. So there's a series of uh, environmental issues here. Um, and uh, so we're moving into a transportation field. Where do you see the larger pressures? Uh, in the change? Um, is it the expansion of renewable energies? Is it the environmental policies? What's driving this yeah. uh, evolution? I think uh, it, it's a combination of, of a lot of uh, factors, let's say. The first thing, going for renewables is the basics of all, let's say. And, but on the other hand, you have a big problem with, uh, let's say, emissions locally and also CO2 emissions globally, yes. And you have to find a solution to that. And the solution in both cases is electric driving. And electric driving includes fuel cell and it also includes battery because this is local, uh, locally it's zero emission. So therefore, we think that it's really the best solution to have that at the end consumer. But um, the driver of all these systems definitely must be a business case, let's say. Yeah. Taking into account uh, environmental aspects, definitely, and there is also, let's say, you should put something that emissions are not for free, but you put to the ambient air. Let's say that is the first thing. And the second thing is, it, there must be definitely be a business case in future. And therefore, in our study, we also look for investments and also high full load hours of the electrolysis, for example. Let's say that you really have the chance to put a business case on that. And uh, let's say in the long term run also, to, let's say, to have emissions reduction, that definitely is also important, but also have a business case, and you have to have both together. That's the most important thing. We're trying to cover a lot of ground. Before I forget, we should mention there is a study available, yeah. um, uh, a fine publication, uh, <laughs> um, so in demand that I haven't got my copy yet. <laughs> but they'll be appearing at the booth, which is Julich right here. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, it's a very important publication. And I believe this afternoon your colleague, Dr. Thomas Gruber, um, from Julich will be talking at the technical forum at 2.40 p.m. Uh, to do a very technical presentation of the results. Yeah. He will uh, give more insights into the numbers and results of the study. If you would like to get this study, so we only have a few hard copies because hard copies are not dying, but let's say they are simply raw. You find it, uh, let's say, fully freely available in the, in the download area of our institute. Let's say if you are interested in that, come to our exhibition and I will show you the, the address. You find the full uh, study available. And um, what we think, the, it is really a scenario that is transparent, all the data are in, you can discuss it, and we are looking forward to your feedback always, and uh, try to enlarge our knowledge on that. Well, on that note, I invite all the guests here, of course, to uh, address further questions to Jochen Linsen. The yes. booth is D68, it's right there. I've been talking to Jochen Linsen, who's um, uh, at the Forschungszentrum Jülich, responsible for the sector coupling yeah. research. Um, it's been a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Hope to okay. see you next year with more information. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jochen. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much for your attention. We will be continuing, jetzt darf ich auf Deutsch, als nächstes kommt ein Pressekonferenz uh, von meinem Kollegen Uli um, Walter. Uh, Wasserstoff, Mobilität in Deutschland, aktuelle Entwicklungen und Projekte. Gäste sind Dr. Klaus Bornhoff von NOW, Nicholas uh, Ivan von H2 Mobility, Oliver Gutt von Hyundai, like Sunday, Hyundai, and uh, Thomas Bistri from Clean Energy Partner. Please stay tuned. The drinks are on the house. Have a coffee, have a tea. We'll be back in one minute. Thank you. <laughs>